Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for being here today on our panel discussion called Why the Travel Industry is Essential in the Fight for Vaccine Equity. My name is Justine Abigail Yu, and I am the marketing director here at Wonderful. I'm guessing that many of you are already familiar with Wonderful since you've made your way here. But if not, welcome to our newcomers. Always so happy to greet new people into our community. Um, Wonderful, for those of you who don't know, is a global community and lifestyle brand that specializes in helping all women travel the world. And we connect our community both online and in person through a thriving online membership network, local chapter events in 50 cities and counting, global summits and small group trips. We're also the creators of the WITS Travel Creator and Brand Summit. Some of you may have heard of us through there, through that particular summit. And while we connect women travelers together, we also focus on amplifying the voices of women and underrepresented people in the travel industry and ultimately strive towards making the industry one that is more equitable, inclusive, and thoughtful. And for those of you who aren't part of our membership, um, our membership community yet, enrollment is open right now and it's a great way to connect with other travel loving women right away, even if you're not traveling right now. Um, and we put on events just like this one multiple times per week and members have access to exclusive benefits such as members only discounts, access to other travel experts and coaching sessions, as well as our on-demand library with the recordings from all of our past events which of course this one will be included in, in that library. So if you wanna be a part of this growing community, visit us at cheesewonderful.com slash join. We do have scholarships open right now for those who are in financial need and you can apply up until December 1st. So please, um, please do join and please do check out our scholarships. Um, money, we never want money to be a barrier and that's why we have made this available. And so I believe Marissa is backstage filling our chat room with these relevant links. Um, and so all those links should be available in our chats. Please check us out later. But for now, I wanted to bring us into focus into this particular topic for today and talk about vaccine equity. So vaccinations, as is the hot topic of the day, we know that vaccinations are significantly lagging at a global level, particularly in low to middle income nations. In fact, I was just reading the other day that less than 3% of people in low income nations have been vaccinated. COVAX, which is the global initiative meant to support low-income countries in acquiring vaccines, has been lagging significantly. You know, we built, you know, the global community, the international community knew that this would be a problem early on and built COVAX, but it is still lagging. They aim to, to purchase and distribute 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines for countries in need by the end of this year, by the end of 2021. But to this day, they have only delivered 400 million doses across 145 countries. So again, the goal was 2 billion doses. We've only distributed 400 million, which is a huge disparity. And this deep inequity in access to vaccines will inevitably mean more loss of life and the continued upending of our daily lives. Global vaccine inequity will have a lasting and profound impact, not just on our health as an international community, but also our global economic recovery. And so what exactly does that mean for the travel and tourism industry? How does this affect the communities we live in and the destinations we travel to? And how can we as everyday travelers and citizens make an impact? So those are some of the questions that we're going to be addressing today. And I wanted to thank our brand partner for this event, uh, Intrepid Travel. Thank you so much for making this event possible and for being a part of this. Um, I know that 
We have Mikey, who's who's part of our panel here today, and I'll introduce him shortly. Um, but they're doing great work around vaccine equity for the travel industry that we can't wait to share with you all today. And so for now, I do want to introduce our panelists. Um, so slowly we will pop up their faces here. <laughs> um, first up, we have Dr. Dominic Akateba, who is currently the Upper West Regional Lead Clinician in charge of TB, HIV, and infectious diseases, as well as the head of Department of Internal Medicine of the Upper West Regional Hospital. Dr. Apateba also works as the country director of Ghana Medical Health, which is an international, international charitable organization working to transform health services and sustainably improve health outcomes for underserved and impoverished, impoverished communities in Ghana and around the world. Dr. Dominic, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we can't wait to hear more from you and especially what's going on in Ghana. So thank you. We have thank Dr. You very much, Justin. Thank you. We have Dr. Nadine White, who is a traveler blo travel blogger by day, physician by night. She runs the blog The Sophisticated Life. She has over 20 years of experience practicing medicine and over eight years of experience as a travel content creator. She's been covering the pandemic, covering what it means to travel during this pandemic. And she's also been covering COVID-19 vaccines, including an appearance on CNN over the last year. Many of you might recognize her as she is a frequent contributor voice within the wonderful community. Thank you, Dr. Nadine, for being with us today. Thanks for having me. And we have Mikey Sadowski. Let's bring him out. Uh, <laughs> who is uh, the GM of Global, Global Communications and Advocacy at Intrapid Travel, which is our brand partner, um, who is also a purpose-driven tour operator that is both the world's largest adventure travel company and Travel B Corporation. Mikey, thanks so much for being here today. And I'm so looking forward to hearing more about what Intrepid is doing in the context of vaccine equity. Awesome, thanks. Last but not least, we have Lily, Lily Germa, who is SCIF's global tourism reporter, who has been covering the pandemic and the need for vaccine equity in the tourism industry throughout the last year and a half. I have personally been watching a lot of your coverage of vaccine equity, Lily, and have been learning so much. Um, and has, your, your articles have really connected the dots for me of how the travel industry is implicated or you know responsible for vaccine equity. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna jump right into questions because we don't have a whole lot of time and this is a huge topic for us to discuss. And so Lily, I was hoping you could actually kick us off here. You've been covering this pandemic and vaccine equity for SCIF during this time. Could you give us a rundown of what's going on and what exactly is causing all of this disparity? Sure. Thank you so much for having me again and for having this really important discussion. So I'll try to sort of give an overview of how we got to, to where we are now and how we started. And I started covering that um, for SCIF and, and for the industry. So basically, earlier this year, in around February, it became very clear from the UNWHO that um, the distributions of vaccines were leaning more towards the wealthier nations. Um, and that happened for several reasons. One mainly is uh, vaccine hoarding. In other words, the US, the Euro Europe, and all of the other uh, top 10 rich countries were at the top of the list in terms of ordering vaccines from the manufacturers. And they ordered way more than what they needed. In other words, you know, two to three times the amount needed to inoculate their populations. Um, and that meant that everyone else on the list was sort of, you know, left waiting and had to wait, you know, months and months because it takes time to produce these vaccines. So they were basically left out, even though they had the money to purchase the vaccines, including, you know, African Union um, member countries um, who also have been speaking out about this. Second is really the big pharma uh, have not been willing to release their IP for um, the IP rights for the vaccines, and that would have allowed a much faster production outside. Um, many, many excuses given for why, for why that wasn't happening, but um, 
that's part of it. Uh, the other part also is uh, manufacturing delays. You know, um, for example, India uh, was producing AstraZeneca and, and they hit a snag there. And um, the World Health Organization's COVAX mechanism uh, was relying on on India's um, supplies. And so, um, as you know, it's it's a COVAX was meant to be really a way to pull donations as well as um, lower priced vaccines for distribution to low income nations. So COVAX kind of just, you know, fell apart. Um, so for me on the on the tourism side, which, you know, um, covering the business of travel, I'm always looking at what's going to affect tourism's recovery during this phase. And it became very clear to, to me and, and, and to my colleagues, you know, early April, um, we were seeing two scenes unfolding. And, and particularly for me as somebody whose life has been shaped by vaccines, you know, so I'm no stranger to, to any of that. I wouldn't have been able to travel as an African in diaspora if I didn't have my, my you know, my yellow <laughs> yellow card <laughs> to travel with. So this is not new. But basically in April, I started seeing two tracks uh, two types of travel recoveries. You know, one was the U.S. reaching an inflection point in April, where the vaccines were a game changer and people starting to hit the road and make plans for a hot vac summer. You know, same in Europe. And then on the other side, we were seeing um, the horrible uh, tragedy in India of the variant uh, spreading. Because why? Because vaccines weren't um, being uptaken fast enough. Um, so we, we we were seeing the two things unfolding at the same time. Also in Turkey, Thailand, Costa Rica, you know, so all of the, the, the low and middle income nations um, and in the Caribbean, which is where I was at the time, um, I could also see that we were also delayed, you know, in, in, in vaccine access. But in the meantime, the Americans were planning to come down to the region, you know, to finally get some sea and sand and whatnot. Um, whereas the rich folks, you know, the rich uh, Caribbean folks uh, and the rich Latin American folks were flying to Miami and uh, flying to New York to get their, their, their vaccine sooner or faster, where everybody else was basically receiving donations from China, you know, so what they call vaccine diplomacy um, and Russia in some cases. So, uh, you know, it was very clear to me that there was a lot of division happening and a lot of fragmentation um, I saw vaccine hesitancy also in the Caribbean. Um, and then parallel to all of that, um, from the business side, you know, I could see travel industry leaders in regions such as the Caribbean or, or Asia and whatnot, um, really taking charge in terms of trying to collaborate, private sector collaborating with the, with the government to help with whatever vaccines they had to distribute giving facilities, helping educate the population so that they could overcome you know, resistance and just doing whatever they could with the resources that they had. And on the other hand, the travel industry in the US, in Europe, uh, you know, Middle East, et cetera, were more focused on opening up the, the borders, you know, um, getting the economy to get running again, which obviously is important because of jobs. Uh, but they were completely missing this element that was that is critical to everyone. And that could undo all the work that they were advocating, you know, for months, it could still, you know, so, so it just became imperative. Um, uh, and, and I'm really, really grateful that my editor in chief is on the same page. Um, and I was able to write that first piece, um, saying, why isn't anyone, you know, in the industry addressing this? Um, and we have a responsibility uh, as an industry that, you know, we, well, putting aside the humanity side, it just makes common business economic sense. You know, you're making, you're doing business in these countries. Um, so it makes sense that you should push for everyone to get vaccinated as soon as possible. And we can all return to a, a, a sense of normalcy. Um, so that's that's pretty much a, the, the overview of how this um, this came about, that skipped. And then I, you know, I mean, months later, right, we're, we're still here. Um, it's gotten worse uh, in terms of, you know, now it's boosters. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the focus is in boosters in, in the rich countries and the surplus that's still sitting there in the U.S. Uh, rather than being redistributed faster is, is, is really um, staggering. So um, I think, as you said, the statistics, you know, less than 4% of people have been vaccinated in low income countries. And the U.S. is sitting on literally in excess of 870 million vaccines that will probably um, about half of that will go to waste um, by the end of the year if it's not redistributed. The numbers are so stark to hear. And Lily, thank you for that overview. So succinct. I know that it's so complex, but you've it done is. It, is. it is. Thank you for 
breaking down all of these different factors, you know, that it isn't just one thing that, you know, hoarding, supply chain, manufacturing issues, um, vaccine hesitancy, there's so many different parts to this yes. problem. So thank you for, for outlining that. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I also, <laughs> I just wanted to also point out, you know, you, you gave some examples of um, specific places around the world, like India and Thailand, um, of what's happening down in those places. And I wanted to ask Dr. Dominic, um, you are in Ghana. And so I wanted to ask you, what are rates like in Ghana? And yeah, how is it, how is it looking in Ghana right now? Yes. So uh, the story is not so different from what uh, Lily uh, did put up uh, with regards to low middle income countries. Uh, Ghana is a tiny country in uh, West Africa. So uh, again, in sub Saharan Africa, uh, it's uh, virtually about the same. Uh, we have a total of about uh, 30 million by way of population. And those who have been vaccinated as, as at uh, the 12th of November uh, from the Ghana Health Service, that's the national service. Uh, data uh, puts it at 4.5% uh, of the population. Uh, the, the difficulty is even more towards uh, the rural parts of Ghana. Uh, so like Lily mentioned, the COVAX facility uh, did help, and Ghana was actually the first country in Africa to receive the COVAX vaccines. We took a delivery of 600,000 doses from the COVAX facility. That was the AstraZeneca vaccine which uh, could only cater for the first dose for the health workers and then some few other uh, dignitaries. The president being the first person to take the job in the country, uh, he did say it was, uh, of course, to highlight the need for the vaccination and to get more people taking the vaccine and the issue about vaccine hesitancy and all of that, as well as the other politicians. So following the first dose of the vaccine, uh, the second dose delayed because we did not get uh, that from the COVAX facility and uh, the country could not as well uh, get those vaccines. Obviously, the richer and wealthier nations were struggling for those. So the second dose, which was supposed to be in May, uh, we only got the donations from the U.S. through the COVAX facility in June. And so most places started the second dose uh, in July. Uh, but this again could only cater for just a fraction of the population and more uh, was towards the health workers again and then the aged uh, so rural folks who were, who did not fall into this category uh, were definitely left out of, of of this so ghana even looks although the picture is terrible uh, by way of the the rates uh, in sub-saharan africa when we say four percent ghana is even sitting at the top there so you can imagine what other countries are. Uh, Nigeria, which is a bigger uh, nation, um, more populous, the vaccine rate is about 1.5% coverage. Mm. So obviously, uh, really terrible. And this unequal distribution of vaccines leave a lot of countries, including those uh, in West Africa, behind in terms of meeting the vaccine targets that have been set by the WHO, looking at the 10% uh, coverage that was set in September, uh, to, be, to be met in September 2021. Obviously, I don't, I don't think uh, realistically uh, for 30 million people in Ghana, uh, majority of full fall uh, in the adult uh, population, we would be able to get to this 10% and uh, the dire consequences on those who are vulnerable, the rural dwellers, the women, and then uh, the children who may not be able to, 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 to get this. Thank you for sharing that and also for pointing out that even, you know, within these countries, there is a disparity, you know, between rural and urban. Again, just highlighting the complexity of this issue. It's, it's the same for, you know, for wealthier nations as well, that disparity between urban and rural. But I can imagine how much deeper that disparity is in places like Ghana and, you know, in the global south. And... I was just wondering, Dr. Dominic, do you, um, are you, I know that you're working on the front lines and I was wondering what are some of the struggles that physicians and health specialists are encountering right now on the ground? 
Yeah, so I actually worked in Ghana's National COVID Treatment Center uh, the, when the outbreak uh, did start. First thing with physicians at the outbreak was the panic, the fear. So most people uh, refused to work in the, the COVID uh, treatment center. We had to go around uh, sort of getting our colleagues to accept to work in search. And once uh, we got a number of people who agreed to work in this, then the issues about uh, personal protective equipment, the PPEs and availability then came in. Then, uh, once we were able to get some good supplies, and now vac the issues of vaccines came in, the challenges mainly were, one, about the vaccine hesitancy. To put it in a, a better perspective, uh, in terms of uh, vaccine as acceptance of vaccines in Ghana, uh, we accept most vaccines. So Ghana's uh, uh, API, that's the expanded program on immunization, has a very good coverage, such that will be able to eliminate a lot of the childhood killer diseases through vaccination, and has been widely accepted throughout the country, even in the remotest of villages. Uh, I'll bet usually the difficulties in getting uh, the vaccines over there. But uh, w with uh, the issues from the media and, uh, of course, uh, social media and its consequences, once people advocated to abstain from these vaccines with all the myths surrounding it that was the bigger challenge for us as physicians to get people to accept and the issue about the high illiteracy rate especially among women and then the rural urban disparities which i've already uh, highlighted the lack of access rules especially to the deprived communities i work in one of such during the rainy season the the only road leading to that entire region of ghana was cut off by floods and as such, there was no access. So they had to fly vaccine supplies over there. And people had to cross rivers to be able to get this. Also, the vaccine shortage, which I've already highlighted, when, once it became available, the country relied so much on the donations from the COVAX facility. So unless there's surplus to be donated from the United States or the bigger economies, uh, we essentially just have to keep waiting. And then the difficulties as well in the cold storage chain and then difficulty handling the critical COVID cases. In the center where I worked, uh, there were times that we needed people to be on the ventilators and these were not available. And these were the real issues that we, we had to struggle with. And Dr. Dominic has actually put together um, quite an in-depth presentation um, to share more about what's happening in Ghana. And we are going to link to that presentation in our chat here. Again, there's so much to talk about. Um, and of course, each country has their unique um, problems and you know issues to go through with this particular issue. And so thank you for sharing that and for doing the work for us in, in understanding what's happening in Ghana, Dr. Dominic. And I wanted to ask both you and Dr. Nadine, what are the consequences of this vaccine inequity continuing on from the health perspective? What what more can, you know, it feels like the last almost two years has been so terrible. Like, is there more to expect if this inequity continues? Well, I will say, I mean, the, and I just have to thank you again, Dr. Dominic, for sharing that. I have to really, acknowledge and recognize our privilege here in the U.S. Um, as a physician who's been on the front line here in the United States, I, I've been horrified just what I've had to go through, but listening to him, I just have to say thank you for what you're doing there in Ghana. Um, it's, it's really humbling. Um, so in terms of what you're asking, Justine, um, for the pandemic to come to an end or in any, in any way possible, we have to get the world vaccinated, obviously. And the thing that will happen is as this continues and we have just certain parts of the world vaccinated and large parts of the world not vaccinated, the virus will continue to, you know, proliferate and we can get more strains. That is the, the fear is that we'll have another deadlier strain that will develop um, and people are jumping on planes and traveling all over the world they can pick up these new strains and take it back to countries who 
are you know vaccinated or feel like they have things under control so i have to often remind people we're still in a pandemic <laughs> and you know you're hopping on planes all over the world and there is a lot of places that you know the majority of people are not vaccinated they don't require people coming there to be vaccinated to be vaccinated and so you know you have to be really cautious about this and the best way to get the virus and the pandemic under control is to vaccinate as many people as possible. This is a global issue. It's a global pandemic. And um, it's, I think this panel is great because it's a reminder to people that that's a global issue that we have to really, you know, get under control and do as the, it's a whole world issue. It's a global issue. It's not just the US or Western world. Uh, we're good. We can just get on a plane and travel now. Um, so I just wanted to definitely bring up that point. So I'm glad we're here discussing it. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Dominic, did you want to add anything to that? Yes. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm glad that, uh, Dr. Naden White has, uh, pointed out the fact that, uh, those who are in welfare nations really need to relook at, uh, of course, how to get the, the world in a better shape rather than having to look inward uh, as uh, wealthier nations. Uh, unfortunately, those of us in very rural environments, uh, proof of it is that uh, the world is a global village. And as such, if you even uh, get over 10% coverage in your communities, once you, you travel in, it allows for mutations, the, the mutants that we've been having. Of course, uh, the, the, the earlier we get to herd immunity, the earlier we're also able to take care of these mutants. And the more mutants we have, who just knows uh, which of the vaccines would not be able to survive with those mutants. So the call is out there for, for, for the bigger economies to uh, look in that regard and help us so that then we could uh, curtail this and allow for global travel. But I will always stress that we need to protect the vulnerable, the women and the children. Thank you. Yes, and absolutely the mutations, the variants. I know that a large percentage majority of those who currently have COVID-19, it is the Delta variant right now. And so exactly what you both you doctors are saying of, you know, how this can continue and how Lily earlier you were saying a lot of the progress that we have made can easily be undone if, you know, we don't make significant changes significant progress um, towards vaccine equity. And so moving into, you know, we're talking about hopping on planes, Dr. Nadine, you know, we are seeing a lot more of that, as you mentioned. And so I wanted to open up this conversation about the travel and tourism industry. Um, and I wanted to throw it really to all of you, um, but L Lily and Mikey specifically, what are the consequences that you see from the travel and tourism tourism industry side of this inequity continuing on? Yeah. I'll let Mike go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, sure. No, I, I think, I mean, I think as, as Dr. White and Lily was talking about earlier, I think one of the big things that we're kind of all talking about and just need to acknowledge that there is what is really perpetuating is kind of the gross inequalities that exist in travel and a lot of the you know scary part of, of the kind of very real neocolonialistic tendencies that travel has this idea that okay the wealthy western world is ready to travel so the whole world now has to open on their agenda and it's this really thing that has existed for a long time and it's it's just very important that we kind of acknowledge that the root of the problem and and really think critically about about that and and as travelers as tour operators as travel companies understanding kind of our place in in that conversation um you know for us i wanted to kind of share just a very kind of real and kind of you know example of how this all kind of came to life because you know there was no and there is no pandemic playbook i think the best thing that you can do from a travel or as a tour operator you just have to kind of navigate it as openly and responsible and do your obligation to the communities that you operate in and and for us it kind of you know this happened this summer where we had a group of fully vaccinated travelers and they went to uh, on a trip to iceland and our leader was scheduled to have their vaccine but they hadn't had it yet and then tested positive for COVID. Or, or travel a, 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 a tour leader it ended up being a false positive but what we started to realize is like oh my like there is a very real you know obligation here we have all this demand 
that want American travelers that want to travel. And we're, we, we actually respond. we can't take them into communities and, and be led by unvaccinated leaders to stay in hotels that are unvaccinated staff. And that was kind of a huge thing where we kind of pumped the brakes and said, okay, now we have to, <laughs> we have to really, really address this head on. And, and that was kind of the, the impetus and the inspiration for our global vaccine equity campaign, which I can talk to later. But I think really the big thing there around that that core question and what are the consequences is that the consequences are are the the entire health of the travel and tourism industry. There is no equitable recovery of the travel and tourism industry without a global vaccine rollout. And truly, travel cannot return unless it returns for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Mikey and I, you know, I think very early on, you know, I was basically repeating, you know, without vaccine equity, there is no full recovery. Um, you know, and it means just an ongoing pandemic, unknown variants, just as um, Nadine um, was telling us, um, and, you know, uneven economic recovery for, for many destinations. And it's just not realistic, as um, Nadine was also saying, you know, that the virus um, doesn't travel, people do. So, um, you know, the, the more you travel, you know, you have this false sense of security because you're vaccinated, but really you're also a carrier. Um, and I think no other region really showed this play out better than the Caribbean, to be honest, because, um, you know, it's so close to the United States and they had such a, a, you know, a mild summer in 2020 before the vaccines came out. And when the vaccines came out, um, you know, we've been seeing um, just, uh, you know, unnecessary number of deaths, you know, due to lack of access, but also um, a lack of um you know, a lot of hesitancy also caused by social media uh, tales and myths and, and whatnot. And my point is, is always, you know, we need to be transparent as an industry and we need to talk to each other more, you know, very fragmented. Um, so I want to commend Mikey because um, and Intrepid because they'll they'll reach out and say, you know, um, you know, that they they read my coverage. Uh, you know, how can we do better and just have a, an open conversation you know, where, whatever segment of travel you're in, um, you know, as Mikey said, there's no playbook here, you know, it, it, we're all figuring it out. And so um, I think that there's very large segments of this industry that need to really look at, at what they're doing and consider the consequences, you know, and I'm sure we'll get into that in a minute. If we do, I've got a whole list of advice for <laughs> these different <laughs> segments that I would like to share because uh, I think at the heart of it all is transparency you know, and, and advocacy. Um, we can make a difference. You know, we, we may be a few voices out there, but we, we can definitely make a difference. I mean, look at the look at the whole climate action movement, right? Um, that's now putting pressure on corporations. It, it, it's possible and it's necessary and it's, it's just critical for all of us to recover in this industry. Yes, so let, let's move in that direction of recommendations and solutions. Mikey, I know Intrepid has been doing a lot um, in an attempt to to bridge this gap, this disparity that we're seeing. And so I want to, and you alluded to, to it earlier about your global vaccine campaign. If you could just share more about what Intrepid is doing in, in this space. Yeah, definitely. And I, I just wanted to obviously echo what, what kind of Lily said just around this idea of like, you know, not having all the answers. I think what, what surprises us is how many people are, are being silent on this issue. And I think there is a very real link between silence and complacency. And I think a lot of people who are, you know, claiming or saying we're a responsible tour operator, but aren't coming anywhere close to this subject. It's, it's a really hard thing for us to reconcile. It's, you know, no one has to have all the answers, but I think it's really important we don't kind of pick and choose what things that we kind of, you know, advocate and have a stance on. And I think we have to be humble and we have to seek solutions openly and transparently um, and not pretend to have all the answers, but also not be afraid to go and find them. So I guess going back to the, your question around what we were saying with with our kind of global vaccine equity campaign, we kind of were like, you know, we were very, very, you know, it, we acknowledged that essentially this was never going to work and traffic was never going to recover with this kind of half in, half out vaccine policy. And we were like, you know, the only way that we can safely, morally, health wise, economically is a mandatory vaccination policy for all of our travelers and tour leaders all over the world. Now, the discussion was taken one step further when we kind of acknowledged that, okay, we can't say that 
you know, 100% of people have to be vaccinated if we're not actually helping to our tour leaders to get vaccines, if helping our porters in Peru to get vaccines, you know, it's much easier to say it, but what is the reality on the ground? Because the, the, re the reality was that the, the challenges weren't people wanting to, there was access issues, there was education issues, and that's kind of really the, what, what started our vaccine equity campaign. So after that, we kind of broke it down into two things. One was we started mobilizing our 25 operations offices around the world to help improve vaccine access and education. So our team, um, our local team in Lima and Cusco and Peru, for example, were lobbying and working with the government to help open a vaccination site in, in Calca, which is where a majority of the porters live, who were having a very difficult time getting access to it. And then on the other side of the world in Sri Lanka, our GM there was hosting, um, working with kind of some doctors were working in the United Nations to run education sessions for our leaders for them to get access to, to very real kind of facts and information about the vaccines. And examples like that were happening kind of in all of our offices around the world with our goal of how can we improve essentially vaccination rates in terms of both access and uptick. And then the other one was our, our uh, fundraiser through Intrepid's philanthropic, philanthropic arm, the Intrepid Foundation. We launched the Give the World a Shot campaign. Intrepid committed $50,000 up front. That campaign has now just ticked over $140,000, which is um, uh, the equivalent of 28,000 uh, people who can be vaccinated because of that. Um, it all helps. It's a, it's a campaign that we're still actively running. We're seeing a lot of travelers engage in it because you know they think to themselves, wow, how privileged am I that I can go on a trip even domestically and you know, for only $5, I can help support the vaccine rollout somewhere else. And I think that's a really important thing is getting travelers to understand that they do have a place in this and every little bit kind of counts. So the vaccine equity campaign started with how can we improve vaccines within our own team? Um, I'm happy to report as of this week, 91% uh, of our tour leaders are fully vaccinated. 97% have received at least one dose of their vaccine, which we started with essentially close to 20% um, only a few months ago. So it's amazing to see the, the result of it. Um, and beyond our Give the World a Shot campaign is still kind of going strong. And, um, you know, after that 50,000 initial donation, we've had almost $100,000 of donations from our community, which has been pretty amazing as well. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, that sounds so great. And thank you for sharing. Um, I think we just shared a link in our in our comment section here of how you can find out more about um, Intrepid and the Give the World a Shot campaign. So if you are interested in that, which I hope you all are, definitely check that out in the comment section. Um, and I, as we veer towards um, discussion of solutions, I'm, I'm noticing a lot of the questions come in from our audience here that I do want to address um, as we talk about as as we talk about solutions. So, from Global Heart Journeys, how can the travel industry in the West, which controls billions of dollars, apply the right pressure to get vaccines to our friends in low and middle income countries? And again, I'll open that up to to any of you, as you're all experts in this. Um, but again, how can the travel industry in the West, which controls billions of dollars, apply the right pressure to get vaccines to our friends in low and middle income countries? Um, I can take that one. I, I, I see two sides of it as far as the industry in those places um, goes. One is, you know, for industry leaders, you know, such as the WTTC, UNWTO, um, they have enormous power to influence the way that um, vaccines are redistributed and accessed. And their advocacy efforts on this have been, um, you know, uh, what's the word? <laughs> Incredibly lacking. <laughs> um, and I think that they have the power to take this as, as one of their, um, you know, one of their pillars uh, as they go forward, you know, as they continue to, to advocate for opening uh, borders and, um, you know, jobs and, and everything else that they're dealing with, uh, which is a lot, but at the same time, none of that matters if we, if we don't have vaccine equity. So I think there's definitely the ability for those bodies to do more. And, and we are all part of this industry. We're all able to get in touch with them and, and, and encourage and pressure them to address this. Um, one of the few leaders in the tourism industry that has been very vocal about the lack of action from these um, international organizations has been um, Edmund Bartlett from Jamaica, the Minister of Tourism in Jamaica, who has been, you know, who's basically been saying sort of get your house in order. Like this is critical. 
our recovery as, as tourism dependent countries. The other side of this is the tourism businesses um, in the US, in Europe, and so on that the, um, the person who asked the question uh, was mentioning. The tourism businesses can do a lot too, not just in the countries in which they do business, but also in their own backyard to encourage you know, and educate and get everybody to get vaccinated because it's not over. We're still in a pandemic, as Dr. Nadine was saying, and also um, there's still resistance, you know, even in the U.S. So they have a dual role. You know, they can encourage vaccination in their backyards and they can also um, see how they can assist the destinations with which they, they, they work and from which they profit, you know, to be frank. Um, at Destination DC, I think, is, is a really great example of, of a, a leadership that is um, doing it differently. I mean, they have a whole uh, website page where they encourage residents and visitors to get vaccinated and they mm -hmm. list all the places that they can go and, you know, um, um, and, and, and get the, the jabs because um, they are very concerned about this inequity in vaccines and they know that it could come back and just turn everything um, over again after all the work. Um, so that, that would be my advice in terms of the, the richest countries um, and the businesses as well as the industry leaders. I have a whole other set of advice for the content creators, but I'll save that for... <laughs> You know that would be a question. <laughs> and I will say just in terms of, because I know I've dealt with this a lot in, ter in terms of ed trying to educate the public about the vaccines um, in terms of vaccine hesitancy and the education aspect is extremely important. Um, as Dr. Dominic says, we are, social media is very powerful. I think people need to be really cognizant of what they post. Uh, what they say on social media about the vaccines, the misinformation that's out there. Um, as a physician, as a content and content creator, I'm very careful about what I post. Uh, for content creators, I think if you are vaccinated and you're traveling to all these places, it'll be important for you to post about it, post about your experience, post that you're vaccinated, talk about the location that you're going to, the tour operators, ask if they're vac what their policies are, are they vaccinated? Um, what the percentages of the place of the people are that are vaccinated, research the destination, talk about all of that in your post, you know, be transparent about it um, when you're posting. And I think that would be really helpful for other people uh, to just get the word out about vaccine equity. Um, so again, when I post, I post everything. I try and educate people. I acknowledge the reason why there is a hesitancy in certain populations. I think it's important to realize, especially in the black population, why there is a hesitancy. And I try to address that. Um, there's going to be a lot of negative comments every time I post about the vaccine and I recognize that, but I try and tackle them head on. And I've had a lot of people tell me after my post that they've, they've gone and gotten their vaccines. And so that means a lot to me. So, you know, we're still in it. The struggle is there, but I think just keep posting, keep trying to educate people um, and, you know, just keep pushing forward with it. So. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just add to that quickly. I think it's really I, I, like what everyone's kind of saying, I think, is this idea that like we can't normalize a, a travel industry that, that kind of celebrates unvaccinated people and that is really accommodating towards mm -hmm. people who have gone that route. I think for us, we, we had obviously a lot of pushback um, from a lot of unhappy customers when we introduced mm -hmm. our mandatory vaccine policy and they said, I'm going to take my business elsewhere. I'm going to take my business mm -hmm. elsewhere. And we're very fine with that. We understand that there's, you know, we have to choose a side here and we're not here to try and make everyone happy. But in that mm -hmm. sense, it's, it's how many other options do they have to take their business elsewhere? Where is mm -hmm. elsewhere? Where are there all these other companies that are, you know, saying, oh, not vaccinated, let's go. I'll take you anywhere in the world you want. And I think that's kind of that idea of like the industry coming together, working together and saying, hey, like there are kind of some standards that we must follow. And mm -hmm. this point that when a company introduces a mandatory vaccine policy, that there isn't an abundance of choice for where else they can go. And right. I think with that is, is that idea of like, we have to continue these conversations and exactly what Dr. White was saying around and what Lily's saying is just the conversation needs to happen. It's not just going to go away and we have to keep going and going and going until it gets to a point where there really isn't meaningful choice outside um, to, to travel all over the world without your vaccine and put other people in harm's way. Absolutely. Well said. Um, I, I want to point out something that I think it was in one of my articles. Um, yes, I spoke to, to Judy Gona, who's a, a sustainable tourism um, advocate and expert in Kenya. And she said to me, um, privileged travelers, you know, people, people are going to decide what they're going to do. They're going to travel, they want to travel, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, privileged travelers have influence 
uh, and, and that influence can be used to inform and, 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 and get people to really think about this issue, even if they're not already. And I'll tell you, a lot of people that don't even think about it probably don't, don't even know better. Hmm. Um, and, um, you know, just as we mentioned, you know, content creators mentioned uh, disclaimers, you know, on when they're being sponsored for something, this should be a disclaimer. There should be a line there saying, you know, be aware that, you know, the vaccine access in such and such destination is at this percent, mm-hmm. you know, um, be aware that there's vaccine hesitancy, be aware that the health system isn't set up to right. serve you. It's, it's set up to serve the residents and um, it's not even adequate very mm-hmm. often for the residents you have the privilege of being able to be evacuated and, and flown to a first rate hospital uh, while residents don't, you know? And so all of these little, uh, you know, key, key information needs to be there. And I just think that it's time to really um, be more ethical, be more transparent as an industry. Um, if we're really talking about building back better, um, you know, it's just a whole, it's, it's, a, it's rhetoric, you know, if, if we're not standing up for vaccine equity, and if we're not speaking up about it and being transparent, at least in our in our content and our posts in our discussions, um, then you know we can't claim anything else. You can't claim to be pro DEI. You can't claim to be, uh, you know, a champion for, for for equity and all of that if you're not pro vaccine equity. It's just not possible. Yeah, and Mikey, what you said earlier about. I don't, I, I will butcher how you phrased it. <laughs> Making sure there is no, like there's no option to travel otherwise mm. without, you know? And Lily, earlier you showed your your immunization. Was it for yellow fever? A whole bunch. So <laughs> I, I don't know if I told Dr. Dominic, but I grew up in West Africa. I grew up in, uh, in, in, in Ivory Coast, yeah, in Cote d'Ivoire. So, um, you know, from when I was a kid, I and mean, we've always had to have a yellow, yellow vaccine, uh, yellow fever uh, vaccine certificate, you know, mm-hmm. it's always been there along with my passport, like always. Um, and then later on, you know, going to Ethiopia, even just before the pandemic, I had my yellow fever renewed here um, in the Dominican Republic, you know, and, um, and then I went to get my, uh, I went to Germany for ITB, which eventually was canceled. And I got a whole bunch like, you know, typhoid and uh, hep A and hep B, whatever. All of those have been a normal part of my life forever. And so, you know, I've got like all of these. I'm just like, quote, my. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I have a little, you know, wallet where I put everything, including my passport. So um, this has been just as important as my passport for me right. forever. And it's the case for millions of people, you know, even if it's new yeah. to, sort of to Americans in terms of traveling with a vaccine certificate, it's not new to the majority of the world. Um, and it serves a purpose, a very important humanitarian purpose Absolutely. to live uh, in good health, you know. Um, and so to have access to that um, and, and to go to places and, and infect people who, who don't have the privilege to have access to vaccines is just utterly unethical right. uh, and if we stand for something as travel industry it is to be you know uh, pro-humanity pro-cultural exchange all of those things um, and from an economic standpoint I mean you just heard um, um, Mikey and Intrepid I mean it makes business sense yeah. I have two more questions here so one is from the postcard jar um, what will it take for the U.S. to give us some of its surplus especially supply that is nearing expiration, to give up mm-hmm. surplus vaccines rather than letting it go to waste. What will it take for the US? I mean, it's, it's, it's really just boils down to, to the um, you know, US Travel Association and, and all of the other groups, um, uh, even the Commerce Department. And if you know this, had a Travel and Tourism Advisory Board. Um, I mean, there, there are lots of folks who are at the highest levels uh, of tourism um, who are now, you know, who have built better relationships now with government. Um, and so we all need to also learn a bit more about the business of travel, you know, uh, as folks who are on the content creation side, um, because we do have a voice, a powerful voice, you know, uh, as people who sell travel. Uh, and they would be, you know, willing to listen. But if no one is really there knocking on their door and putting fire in their, their, under their, um, you know, you know what, then it's just not going to happen because they're more focused on, you know, money. So <laughs> that's that's what it is. Yeah. So I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, it's it's basically all of us coming together and just calling, emailing, 
demanding, you know. One more question here. While we are hearing how we need to get the rest of, while we're hearing how we need the, to get the rest of the world vaccinated, do you have recommendations on what to do when it comes to the worst COVID deniers or rigid anti-vaxxers that won't budge? And I'll extend that question even, um, you know, even in these countries that are, you know, low, in, low to middle income countries, we're all experiencing some level of vaccine hesitancy, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah. what are some solutions to, to get, not get over, but to, to solve for this, to solve for this issue of vaccine hesitancy? What have you been doing? I know all of you have doing, yeah. doing your own work. Yeah. So. It is definitely tough. I will say I have members of my family who are still not vaccinated. <laughs> and I've been a physician for over 20 years and <laughs> I've had family meetings and I still can't get some of my family members. And I have to say, of course, you know, living in the US, I tell them, you know, they're privileged because everybody else around them is vaccinated. So it automatically protects them. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, showing the science, you know, I wrote a whole article about the vaccines that laid out everything about each vaccine, the science behind them, um, the ingredients even, you know, now I could understand maybe when the vaccines first came out, I got my first shot in December of last year. I was nervous, you know, I'm not going to say I wasn't nervous. So I could see people being hesitant initially, but now that there's billions and billions of doses that have been given, we have all the data that shows, you know, how effective they are against serious illnesses and death, um, the studies that are out now, even with children. I. You know, it's it's harder now for me when somebody throws out these reasons why they're not why they're not getting it, yeah, and they still want to jump on planes and travel unvaccinated to all these countries. It, it's tougher for me when people um, come to me with with um, reasons now. But still, I think you have to show the science. I think you have to show the data. Um, I work in a hospital, and I post often on my Facebook page that. I'm admitting patients over and over again that are unvaccinated. These are right. unvaccinated people that are in the hospital, unvaccinated teenagers, unvaccinated adults. And people still act shocked, like, oh, but really? There are vaccinated people can get it. Yes, they still can get it. But the ones that are being hospitalized that are in the ICU and are dying are ones that are unvaccinated. And so, you know, I think just still pushing it, the education, pushing the data, pushing the science behind it uh, is what we have to do. And hopefully, I think the numbers definitely keep going up in terms of the amount of people that are getting vaccinated. So I think the education piece does work. Um, and again, being cognizant of what you post on social media. And there's a lot of people I know, travelers, content creators that have been vaccinated, but they haven't shown that on social media. And so I do encourage people here who are vaccinated to, t to tell people that, show on social media, put that in your caption, let people know that you're yeah. not just out traveling the world, but you're doing so vaccinated to make sure that you're a responsible traveler. So Dr. Dominic, I'm sure you have um, something to add on that. Yeah, sure, that, that, that's great. So for us, uh, we, we, we summarize it in three ways, education, advocacy and the experience so by way of the education mostly uh, because a couple of our people are illiterate we would use uh, pictures to educate mm -hmm. them and we would usually uh, educate in the local languages mm -hmm. and then the advocacy with the policy leaders the opinion leaders and then of course showing pictures of us vaccinated if you look at the powerpoint presentation mm -hmm. i sent in my first the opening uh, slide will show me taking the job so we, we will show these to uh, usually our clients during the education that we have taken it. And I uh, there was a funny thing going on in Ghana that when you take the vaccine, you won't speak like a Chinese. So I've taken the vaccine and I don't, I don't, I don't understand Chinese, neither do I speak that such. So, <laughs> <laughs> so some of those uh, uh, pictures would, would put in. And then the, the other uh, part of it is the experience, which we have gotten so many people because of that. The experience with other vaccines. So uh, the, again, in my PowerPoint, you realize that I did highlight 
on the malaria vaccine trial that Ghana was one of the African countries selected to do that. Initially, there was some hes hesitancy, but now most people would go in for it. And we also look at the other childhood killer diseases that almost about 90% of children in Ghana are covered by way of vaccination when it comes to these. And so the science is there. We'll show them the experience with the other vaccines and the fact that people took these and sometimes do have uh, uh, some uh, acute complication or the other, like some fever, some headache, and one, two days they get out of it. So we're able to demystify what other people would have thought are uh, really serious adverse effects that they would have. So these three points are what we use. And of course, for now, I think uh, the issue about hesitancy, which a lot of people did pick from the social media, we'll be able to dispel a lot of that. And uh, quite a significant number of people are coming in for the, the vaccine. Uh, it's rather more toward availability, more of uh, for us, rather than the hesitancy per se uh, in the rural environment. It's the education that has done the magic and the experience with the other vaccines that have worked without any issues at all. Excellent. And Mikey, I know that you mentioned this earlier as well in terms of what Intrepid is doing. One example that you shared was the work you're doing in Sri Lanka in terms of education. Um, I don't know if you wanted to elaborate more or just touch on on that again. Uh, no, I, I just think just my only thing to add there, I just think from my personal experience living in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I think beyond, I think the huge thing is this whole like kind of supply and demand and this idea of like what 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 are your privileges and what are your rights and i think that's one of the huge things that's come down to is when we started getting our vaccine passports here our vaccination rates just well, spiked when people started realizing that i actually just can't parade freely around my city with without kind of consequence or understanding or, or transparency around my vaccination status and i think that's one of the, the big things as well is, is there's this idea that I don't need to get vaccinated. I can still do everything. All of these things are my rights. But what we've all started to understand is that there are so many things in life, travel being one of them, that are well and truly a privilege. It is a privilege to visit communities around the world. It is a privilege to go and see other places and to share your experiences around the world. And that is a privilege that we all have to really, really take seriously and acknowledge. And that's something what this has been a recalibration of is, is the acknowledgement of your privileges and that if you want these privileges, there are certain rules to do this to ensure the safety of not only your community and your country, but essentially all of humanity. I want to add that I think consumer publications have a huge responsibility here and, and, and a huge opportunity as well to influence um, travelers to, to be more responsible and, and more aware of vaccine equity. Um, you know, uh, it, when I see articles, you know, that look like they were published in 2017 or 18, you know, with, with, with sort of where should I go now? And this is the best places to go. And there's absolutely no mention of anything related to, to vaccine equity. I find that highly offensive and, and a very colonial mindset. Mm. You know, so I think that consumer needs to wake up and, and really do much better. Um, and, and we're including luxury travel pubs. And I've been highly disappointed to see the content that's coming out um, and more encouraged by some that are changing. You know, like Condé Nast Traveler is doing a great job, I think, in terms of pushing the conscious traveler, um, you know, uh, message. Um, but many more need to follow. Thank you all so much to think about and also a lot of action points for us to to take and to actually do something moving forward. So I thank you all so much for this incredibly rich conversation. Um, I, I know that there were a few questions. I kind of saw some questions popping in last minute here. Um, I'll ask Marissa to include or to, to drop everyone's links again on social in case anyone wants to connect with our panelists and ask further questions later. But for now, I wanna thank you all. I want to encourage you all to take a look again at Intrepid's Global Vaccine Equity Campaign. It's such an amazing, amazing campaign that's going on and one of the few that I'm seeing in the travel industry right now. And so again, Marissa is gonna drop the link there so that you can learn a lot more about it, see how you can get involved with the Give the, Shot, Give the World a Shot um, campaign. And what else do I want to say before you all go? There is another... yeah. Say that Sorry. again. If you want to learn more about the business of travel and the important issues, please follow skip.com and you can also subscribe. 
Thank you, Lily. We also have an event coming up with Dr. Nadine White on November 22nd on traveling safely during this time. So from a, you know, citizen traveler perspective, more tips on what to do before, during and after a trip to stay healthy during the pandemic. Our friends at Rise Travel Institute also have a course on the ethics of traveling during this time of pandemic. Again, we'll drop the link um, in our chat. I saw Vinci in our chat. So definitely check that out. We have, again, we're slowly starting to have more conversations about this. Hopefully this conversation today is just one of many, many more that we will have in the travel industry. Because again, you know, we are still in a pandemic, contrary to what we might see on social or in mainstream media, we are definitely still in a pandemic. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And we are you know, in a critical point where Lily, what you said earlier just really has been staying with me that so much of the progress can be undone very, very easily. And so I hope that you all continue to stay engaged in these conversations as difficult as they may be. Um, and again, thank you for joining Wonderful for this conversation. And thank you for Intrepid for sponsoring. Thank you, Dr. Nadine, Dr. Dominic, Lily, Mikey, for being a part of this conversation. And all of you who are listening, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.